most places I go, it's really humbling um, to see the response. And, and I tell a lot of people that wherever I go, uh, none of this is real until I meet the people who come to these events and tell me what fully involved me into them. Um, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, most of the time, fully involved exists six inches from my face, holding my cell phone out there, sending a picture out, sending a meme out, um, sending out some sort of a random thought bubble that, that goes out. And hopefully it serves to you know, further your passion and keep things alive for you. So that's what it's all about. And today is all about listening to new voices. And I really do believe that you, know, you can lead from anywhere, and that's what Fully Involved is all about. Okay? And most places that I go, I get a pretty, pretty warm reception. Uh, and uh, people are pretty receptive to the message, and they're pretty nice. Um, but occasionally, I'll go places. And in, in the vein of leading from anywhere and listening to new voices, a couple years ago, I was down in, in Southern California doing a class and, uh, or doing a presentation. And a uh, fire chief from one of the bigger agencies in Southern California came up to me and said, hey, I'm bringing my whole A staff to your presentation, and we really want to implement the fully involved idea, the big four, do your job, treat people right, give all that effort, have an all-in attitude. Excellence is my responsibility. All those notions, we want to bring those to our organization. So what we'd like to do is have you come and give a presentation to all 300 of our company officers in our agency. And I was pretty excited about it. I felt like I'd really arrived, and it was like this big thing, right? And so um, the first day I go down there, they'd all been mandatory to be in the class, right? Um, but I was pretty excited about the fact that I was speaking to 300 company officers from a big organization in Southern California, and I'm from California. So about three quarters of the way through my presentation, and all of their apparatus in this agency, all 120 engine companies, I don't know how many truck companies they have, but all of their engines and trucks say, excellence is my responsibility somewhere on the rig based upon the fully involved idea and their staff coming to the, the class. So I'm talking to the group, and uh, I'm getting basically no reaction from people. Everybody's sitting there, arms folded, kind of like some of you are right now, skeptical. And um, as, uh, as I'm going along, I'm trying to get buy-in. I'm trying to get audience participation, because that's the big thing. I try to connect with the audience, and I have this big need for attention, and it works for me. And so at, at one point, I'm doing my thing. None of the jokes are working. Everything's bombing. I'm, and I'm, and uh, this one guy finally sticks his hand up as I, as I start going into the excellence is my responsibility thing, idea. Throws his hand up, and he says, hey, this excellence is my responsibility idea. Is that yours? And I'm, yeah, brother. Thank you. That's cool. And I'm thinking he's going to be excited about it. He goes, he goes, that's bullshit. And I go, ooh. <laughs> I'm like, so I go, okay. Um, and I, he was pissed. And uh, he goes, you know, I'm here for this leadership class. I've got to be here all week. You know, you're the first speaker. And he goes, I'm expecting some leadership guru to be standing in front of me, some guy with some gray in his hair and a mustache. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what does my age have to do with anything, right? And so he, he goes off, and he's going, and he's going, and he's going, and he goes, and finally he ends up with, you know, you know, you're just a kid. And I go, okay, and I let him do his thing. And I knew he wasn't pissed at me. I knew he was pissed at his organization or something else because he didn't know me. And I don't even think he heard the fact that I started off the presentation by saying I've been a company officer for 10 years. I've been in the fire service for 18 at the time. Now it's 20. And uh, he goes, you're just a kid. And I, I said, OK, brother, are you all done? He goes, yeah. And he sits back down. I go, well, I'm not sure what my age has to do with anything, brother, but how old do you think I am? He goes, I don't know, 37. I go, well, I'm 44. Thank you very much. And uh, I go, how old are you? He goes, I'm 56. I go, well. I like older men. What are you doing after class? Let's go hang out. <laughs> so I try to keep it light. I try not to take myself too seriously. And again, today is not about you know, me. It's about the new voices. It's about hearing what the new leaders in the fire service have to say. And I really believe that you can lead from anywhere. So what I wanted to do today to keep it really mellow and just to kind of start things off was talk a little bit about passion and where things come from. And the origins of Fully Involved and, and how it kind of started. And so what I wanted to do was kind of take you on a journey through the blog of some of the things that I wrote a number of years ago um, that really helped me voice, put a voice to this passion that I felt 
Because I know like some of us in the room, our passion is a great thing. It's something that really drives us and it motivates us and it keeps us going. But sometimes it's a two-edged sword, right? Where passion can actually get us into a lot of trouble. Great, you're passionate. That's awesome. What are you going to do with it? Right? Is it something that, that is, is aimless and angry? Or is it something that gives you purpose? And I think that sometimes we have to make sure that we're making sure that we follow our purpose. We know our why. So that it doesn't become something that's misguided, misdirected, aimless, and angry. Okay? So, um, a number of years ago, when the financial downturn was occurring, and fire services across the country were subjected to tremendous scrutiny, and we were in the public eye, and they wanted a piece of our ass. They wanted to take money away, they wanted to know what we were doing all the time. And in, in the city in which I work, um, you know, people like to blog and they like to talk about, you know, um, what the firefighters do all day. And when they were talking about, you know, our pensions and our pay and all those things, and they, they wanted to take some of that stuff away, I remembered seeing a blog, a, you know, a, an article, and then there were, there were people commenting on it. And one of the comments on, you know, this, this blog was, I see the firefighters sitting around in the station a lot of times, and it doesn't seem like they're doing very much. And that really, for whatever reason, that really stuck in my craw funny. And I, I thought about it, and I, I, I thought, God, you know, those people have no idea what we do. They have no idea that everything that we do is so that we're ready. They don't know how much we care. They don't know how much we prepare for everything that we do. Everything that we do is so that we're ready. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to read to you some of the blogs that I had written a number of years ago. And the one that I just mentioned to you um, turned into a blog called So I'm Ready. And so what I'm going to do is take you on a journey through the blog and talk about some things for a little bit, again, just to kind of warm things up. And that's why we have the stool here, because this is supposed to be sort of unplugged and chill. So uh, this is So I'm Ready, OK? It goes like this, So I'm Ready. This is how it starts. I wake up at 5 AM, rub the sleep from my eyes, and drive to the local coffee shop to get a cup of coffee. I drive 25 miles to the firehouse. I get to work at 545, put on my running shoes, and run the streets of the district I protect for an hour to learn the streets and the hydrants better as I exercise. So I am ready. I get back to the station, and I work my body hard in the weight room for another 30 minutes. Then I stretch. I shower and put on my uniform. So I'm ready. I call my family and make sure that my kids hear my voice before they're off to school. I tell them I love them, so I'm ready. My shift officially starts and I meet with my exhaust, exhausted, off-going counterpart. We talk about the busy shift the day before. I place my gear on the engine and I set it up so I can don it quickly if the bells strike. I put my radio in its case and I set it to the proper channel, so I'm ready. I put my breathing apparatus on. I meditate on being lost, trapped, or injured in a fire. I recite my emergency radio transmission. I practice breathing techniques to slow my heart rate and keep myself calm. I check every piece of equipment on the engine with an attention to detail as though I'm packing my own parachute. In a way, I am. I do it the same way every time, so I'm ready. I sit at the kitchen table and meet with the crew. We review a line of duty death report from somewhere far away. The firefighter dies in the line of duty an average of every three days. We commit the matter in which death stalked them to memory, so we're ready. We leave the station on the engine and go to a secluded parking lot to practice our craft. We pull a hose from the engine, training on road skills in anticipation of the next fire. We do it time and again. Each time we fold the hose precisely in the bed. We sweat and ache as we train, so we are ready. We prepare for the unimaginable. We plot and scheme ways to confront things that most people don't dream up in their worst night terror. We work on every weakness in anticipation of the moment of truth. We plan, creating memories of a future we hope will never come to pass, so we are ready. We accept that everything we were taught growing up is a bold-faced lie. It's not always going to be OK, but we are dealers in hope. We are the ones who stand in front and say, stand behind us. We're here to help, so we are ready. We study our enemy with a lust for knowledge that only one who probes a lethal adversary can fathom. We know what fuels a fire, a thing alive that moves with a swiftness and absolute fear of a maelstrom. We devise ways to defeat it with overwhelming force or subtlety and finesse, so we are ready. 
We go to an elementary school and teach smiling, bright-eyed children about fire safety, meeting places, and smoke alarms. We show them how to stop, drop, and roll and tell them not to play with matches, so they are ready. We are in the classroom and we practice for hours, so we are ready. We perform life safety inspections at local businesses. We walk every inch of the buildings from the roof to the basement. We learn the buildings, their contents, their traps, and their hazards, so we are ready. We battle fire, we dodge cars on the freeway, we attempt to save someone whose heart has stopped beating, we cut someone out of a mangled car, or we help someone back into bed who's too old and weak to pick themselves up off the floor when they fall. We deliver a baby or comfort someone in death. These experiences we file in memory to be retrieved in the future so we can form a, perform at a higher level on the next run. We're always ready. I write a letter to my family. I tell them how much I love them and that if for some reason I never come home, the last thought that blossomed across my mind was about them. I put it in an envelope and tape it to the inside of my locker. I love you always so they are ready. I call my family and tuck them to, to bed by phone. I pray a fleeting prayer to God a God I've never seen and I'm not sure even exists based upon what I know, to give me strength. I hope he is with me, so I'm ready. Thank you. And what that was, was that was me really trying to get my passion out. I was so pissed about the fact that people pick us apart and talk, you know, shit about the fact that, you know, we, about what we do, because they have no idea. And what pissed me off about that was I would never dream of walking into someone's place of business and you know, walk up and claim to know what they do or how they do it and sit there and, and dissect you know, their, their work place. So that's kind of where that came from. Um, and um, as we progress through our career, you know, I mentioned the fact that you know, some of us in this room are, are super passionate. All of us in this room actually are super passionate. That's why we're here. That's why you're here on a Monday. Um, but that passion can sometimes get us into trouble, and we have to channel it in the right direction. And we have a, a subculture in the fire department that's kind of scared of people that are fired up about the job, people that are excited about it. And so we can kind of get that rogue moniker for those people that are out there trying to do things and push and, and stretch and become better. And we're the ones that are out there trying to make a difference, right? Um, that scares some people. And so a lot of times what, what happens with people that are passionate in the fire service, and we had this discussion last night when um, we were at, at dinner at Kells. I went to the wrong Kells, by the way. I went to Kells Brewery, and I was supposed to be at Kells Pub. There's two of them here in town, so um, I got there eventually. But I was talking to one of the guys last night at dinner, and, and we were talking about, you know, they, they were told to chill out. If they wanted to get the things passed through, you know, push the things along that they were trying to push through, they were told that they needed to mellow out. And I got the same talk, okay? And after, you know, being involved in a lot of things at the company level, at the department level, at the state level in the state of California, um, you know, we want what's best for our brothers and sisters. Right? We want the best for them, and we want them to be safe. And when we go out and we learn things at conferences, or if we take a class, we want to bring those things back and we want to be heard. And I really believe that the fire service belongs to the young people. Okay? My job as I get on in years in the fire service is to facilitate you know, the wants and needs and the dreams of those people that are coming up behind us. Part of what's important for us to do as we get on in years in the fire service is to maintain that illusion that there still is a Santa Claus or an Easter Bunny, that the job is still magic even if we've lost, even if we've become somewhat dispassionate. But the one thing we have to do is we have to listen to new voices, and we have to allow them to be heard. Because if we don't, we get stale, we stagnate, and things stand still. But we have a big problem in the fire service, culturally listening to new voices and listening to new ideas. And that's why this venue here today is so important. Okay. And when I, was, when I was kicking and screaming and trying to make changes, within my organization, and like I said, I'd gone out and I'd seen that the world wasn't flat, that it was indeed round, that there were other ways of doing things, that it wasn't just you know, the way that we did things in the city in which I work, that there was this big, beautiful place out there where, where people shared ideas and they listened. I'd found my people, right? You come back and you're told to shut up. You're told to disappear, okay? And at first, you know, they'll mock you. They'll tell you to disappear, but if you stick with it long enough, They'll start to follow you if you're doing things the right way, if you send your message out in the correct manner. Okay. But 
Here's a conversation that I had with, with um, someone who I worked with um, when, uh, you know, I was, again, I was, I was super fired up and uh, I wanted to make a difference and I got, got constantly told that as a firefighter you can't make those changes. You have to wait until you promote to captain. And I was sure that once I got promoted to captain, if I ever got promoted to captain, that when I got there, I was going to be told the same thing. You can't make those changes until you make BC or deputy chief, whatever it is. So this is called disappear. A well-intentioned coworker took me aside as I prepared for the promotional exam that I had so long wanted and placed his hand on my shoulder and asked, what's your deal? In return, I offered a puzzled look as the conversation stumbled down an awkwardly familiar path. He continued, you need to tone it down. People are saying you're a bit over the top. If you want to get promoted, you need to disappear. Disappear? I stiffened inside as I listened to his words. What was wrong with me that doing things my way went against what was socially graceful, safe, or right? It was the part of me that I always despised, but I'd always seemed unable or unwilling to change it. What had made me such a misfit, living my life with my head lowered, so dead set on testing limits, permanently at odds with the world around me? Why was I forever pushing up wind, uphill, and upstream? Disappear? I began to consider what I was being asked to do. Was I wrong? Was it me? I realized that I was being asked to compromise what I felt was right, to realign my true north, and my heels dug in once again as they had from the moment I was born. I was being asked to do what was easy as opposed to what I knew was right. It wasn't me. Quit had never been in my vocabulary, but fight and adaptation were always a part of my life. History has proven that wars are won by those who are students of, the, of battle stories, those who press on despite the best efforts of those who try to hold them back. A wide, satisfied grin spread across my face. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute, I'm not sorry, I will not disappear, I won't be put in a box. I not so suddenly rolled my eyes and my inner monologue went something like this. Here we go again. I had heard it all my life, so I took a deep breath, counted to five, and let the words permeate. I offered an even, biting retort. Good, that's the point. I'm fired up, I love this job, and I'm not sorry about it. No apologies, no excuses. Not then, not now, not ever. Excuses are useless to me. My friends don't need them and nobody else will believe them. I will strive to be my best every day. For, for me, it's not about appeasing the masses. It's about improved performance. My job is to make my crew as safe and effective as we can possibly be. It's not about checking boxes. I'll let my, my crew's performance do the talking. What's your deal? If you have no ideas, then you can't be a nuisance. A big part of what it means to lead is having the courage to disobey, not in a soft, sophomoreish revolt against the establishment for the sake of conflict, but because you feel that there's a better way to be found through independent thought, innovation, communication, and teamwork. The path of most resistance is where the biggest change occurs. Are you gonna do what's easy or what's right? Disappear? No thanks, I'm not going out quietly. Don't like it? Tough shit. So, that's disappear, so. I know that a lot of you in the audience have, have had those conversations, right, where it's, it's like, hey, if you want to move forward, um, you have to tone it down. And so what ended up happening with me, you know, I, I had that talk. And in order to move forward, I actually had to, you know, come into work, do my truck checks, you know, and do all the training, all the things that we were supposed to do, right? But I did actually have to sort of tone it down and bite my tongue a lot of times. And when I finally did take the captain's test and I strung enough right answers together to get promoted, um, you know, when I sat in my chief's interview, after everybody left, one of the deputy chiefs, who was you know, one of my former company officers, said to me, hey, just so you know, it was a push to get you promoted because you speak your mind too much. Okay? And sometimes we have to adjust, we have to ration our passion. Right? Everybody says that you know, we need to be passionate. We want those passionate individuals in our organizations but we have to find a way to adjust our message because sometimes it is me. It is the, I am the problem. I'm the one who's not communicating effectively. Okay? I'm not saying don't lose it, but just keep your passion you know, and keep it alive, you know, but just don't cut yourself with it. Okay? So you know, I kind of muddled my way along throughout my career and um, you know, a lot of a lot of what's being generated in the fire service now is, is metric driven. You know, they say, in God we trust, right? But all others must bring metrics, <laughs> okay? Um, and 
it, I started thinking about all the things that we measure ourselves against. You know, what's our legacy going to be? And, you know, a lot of times we're measured by how many training hours we, we log in the book, how many inspections we make, you know, that kind of thing. How often we get our paperwork in on time. What's the quality of our reports? But to me, the most important thing is the person inside the uniform. It's not, you know, it's not about numbers. It's not, I've never been about that. That's never been something that's motivated me. And um, that's where this blog came from, and this is called Measure. So uh, there's a difference you can find in those who stand apart from the crowd, those people of character who just seem to get it. The intangible quality that sets them apart is something that's completely tangible. It's called a work ethic, and it's the oft-forgotten element in the journey to building or rebuilding a culture. You can feel it when you touch a book, when you pick up a tool, or when you wipe your brow when it is slick from sweat. Too many times we give accolades for simply showing up, keep, keeping a seat warm, or holding down a spot. Commendations are handed out like participation ribbons. We talk change, we talk about improved performance, but we go no further. Changes are made by those who take action. Activity should never be confused with achievement, and just because you exist, it doesn't mean you deserve. The privilege of wearing the uniform and the gifts of service is something that is earned, and it is not a right. Ask yourself, who's in there? Do you remember what it took to get to where you are today? Do you remember the promises that you made? Do you remember who you said you'd always be? Find that person again. Remember how you used to measure yourself. Do your job right because you said you would. You said you'd do it forever that way. Actions speak louder than words. Ask yourself, who's in there? And if you don't like the answer, take the first step towards change. The uniform doesn't give you power or credibility. Your actions do. Wearing tights and a cape doesn't mean that you've earned the right to be called a superhero. You are what you repeatedly do. If you believe that excellence is your responsibility and you strive for that day in and day out, then that's where you will go. If you bellyache and talk change and are unable or unwilling to make the change in yourself, then you'll stand still. The right to be proud and confident is one that is earned over a career of hard work, dedication, of attempts and failures. Excellence isn't easily achieved, and in the same way, neither is confidence. Confidence is hard won and fleeting. We are perceived to be these larger-than-life creations that defy natural laws and are the very image of all that is right. The fact is, we're human. We are full of faults, shortcomings, and insecurities. To overcome these, we must be tireless in the pursuit of our ideals. The importance of holding one another accountable cannot be overstated. Accountability is a discipline. We do it for the person next to us. We do it for each other. We do it on our own together. I want to do what I'm meant to do. I want to do it with passion. I want to do what makes other people feel. When my career is over, I want to be remembered for the things that cannot be measured. I want to look back and say, I did my job. When everything else has faded away, nobody, nobody will remember the metrics. They'll remember the person inside the uniform. If you're not living up to who you said you'd always be, you'll just be at a costume party for 30 years, and you'll quickly be forgotten. If that's what you choose, you can choose to walk away from your career with only your certificate of attendance. I'm not going out like that. That's measure. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I mean, those are, those are the types of things that, you know, the, the blog and, and the way that it started was, was something that was really therapeutic for me. And these were the ways of getting my thoughts out and the, the frustrations that, that I needed to air. And the way that it all kind of began was I started writing articles for Fire Engineering in 2011, I think, it was when I had my first article published. And, and So I'm Ready was something that I submitted to the magazine, which was actually rejected, because they said that it was more suitable to be a blog rather than um, you know, an article. And so I was pissed, and, and they set me up as a blogger. And, and when, when I started um, blogging, a lot of the things that, that I was doing, I wanted to make sure that I had my name attached to it because when the blog, when the, there were a lot of angry bloggers out there at the time, you know, 2011, 2012, and all of them were saying the same thing. They wanted change, 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 change. And they were pissed at the apathy that they saw within their organizations and they wanted things to be better. And as they were writing, they wrote under pen names and they wrote under pen names because they didn't want to get into trouble. And as I was, you know, working through this therapy, through writing, I put everything out there and I published it, and I put it out there on the web, and I attached my name to everything that I wrote. 
because I thought that you know, I, I wanted to be a person of integrity that stand behind, stood behind everything that I had to say. And about a year or two later, I wished that I had been writing under a pen name because I got, <laughs> I got myself into a lot of trouble. Um, but if you're going to be somebody that, that tries to change things, that tries to you know, push and kick and scream and try to make things different, you need to be ready to have a target on your back because you're going to have one. Okay? Um, but keep going because the people that make the changes are the ones that say what they're going to do and then they actually do it. Okay? Words alone don't make a difference. You know, it's, it's the fact that you people are here hearing the messages that you're going to hear today and you take those back to your organizations and you say to your people, hey, this is something that I learned. Let me show you something that's going to make your life easier. Let me show you something that I learned in a class that can help you out, help you out in your career. Okay? Um, so, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> you guys have any questions or anything? Anything you'd like to talk about? Any questions about the blog or, or you know, some of the, the things that I can help you guys out with, some of the, the things that I endured? Do you have any questions about anything? Let me know. Well, that's an interesting question, and, and um, there was a blog that I wrote about that called Treat People Right, and maybe I'll pull that up in a second and read that, but the adjustment that I made was I had to realize, um, I read some books on philosophy, and I was reading Buddhism for Beginners, and it talks about this, this idea of impermanence. Anybody familiar with that? Okay. It's this idea, and I'm going to paraphrase because I read it a long time ago, but it's this idea that everything is in a constant state of decay, and we want things to be the way that we want them to be, and that's how we think we're going to find happiness. And an example of that is you get a new car, and you think that when you get that new car, it's going to make you extremely, that's going to be the, 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 you know, the base of all your happiness. Well, you take that car to the mall, and some asshole opens their door and dings your door, and now you've got this brand new car with a door ding, and all you see is that door ding, so you're pissed every time you look at the car. So we rely on all these external factors to make us happy, okay? And somebody pointed that out to me, and they handed me that book. And so <clears throat> what I had to realize and where I had to adjust my perspective was I realized that not everybody shares the same motivations as I do. Not everybody's as excited about the job as I am, or we are as a group. And I had to adjust my delivery style to that. I had to realize that, you know, it doesn't work when you go up to people and you're super excited about the job and you want to wrap your hands around their neck and strangle them and say, why don't you love this as much as I do? It doesn't work. People are like, dude, you're coming at me way too hard. Right? So you got you know, you to find a way to speak to your audience, not speak at your audience, and realize that you know, sometimes a soft sell is more important than telling everybody that you, know, you could die on this job if you don't do it right, which is absolutely true. We know that. But sometimes, that, and that was something that I had to do in myself was, was find out, you know, Sometimes it was me, how do I just adjust the message and realize that you have to tailor your message to the individual person. And that's why when I talk about you know, leadership stuff, I talk about really getting to know the person that you're, you're speaking to. And that's why I have that 10 for you, 10 for me leadership contract that I employ with my guys where it's like, I hear, you know, these are the 10 things that I expect from you as a firefighter, and then these are the 10 things that you can expect from me as a company officer. And we sit down and we work through those things together so that we're speaking to each other. It's not me dictating what's going on as the company officer. It's me saying, here's what I give to you, and I need to hear who that person is. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Hey, Mark, uh, you talked a lot about uh, Riverside County, and I kind of got a rough start, rough uh, uh, acceptance there. What, when did you, like, nail it? Where the, the you know, organization just clicked right with your message and there was a radical change? After PDX 2015. <laughs> no, I, you know, I don't, that's, that's an interesting question. And the question was, you know, when did you, you see that the culture really took root? And I don't know that, I don't know that you can ever really point to any one moment where you say it's working or it's clicking, you know, because I, I think that culture is deliberate and it's something that we, we have to set out to do every single day. We have to remind ourselves every day, and that's why we have it on the wall. Do your job, treat people right, give all that effort, have an all-in attitude. We have those things up there so that we hold each other accountable to a standard. But in answer to your question, you know, when did you have that 
epiphany that it, it might be sticking. Um, we were going through a lot of cultural changes in our organization and some things that, that caused a lot of pain and, and struggle with strife within our organization. And um, we were in a, a company officer meeting where they had a brainstorming session about how we were going to change the culture in our organization. Change, 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 change. And there were all these big, um, you know, easel pad signs on the wall with really bad looking, you know, shorthand, you know, change is scribbled and it, it just, it looked like really bad modern art. And we were sitting in this meeting waiting for it to commence and, and the, you know, our staff, you know, as well intentioned as they were, they, I, I think that they didn't understand what was going on at the line level. And as we're waiting for this meeting to start, I'm looking at all these signs all over the walls, knowing that they've brain, been brainstorming and talking about changing the culture in our organization. And I began to think to myself, well, what's wrong with the culture in our organization? Is there really anything wrong with it? And my mind drifted to, this, to a conversation that I had with one of our rookie firefighters um, some weeks before this, where you know, we were sitting in the chairs at the, at, the, at the station, and he and I were just in the day room by ourselves, kind of having a quiet moment. And I said, hey, man, congratulations on getting through probation. It's a, it's a big deal. And uh, you should be proud of it. And uh, I had begun to tell all of my self-deprecating stories of the, you know, my misadventures on probation and all the things that had occurred to me and how I'd been done wrong so many different ways. And, you know, some of it was my fault. But, you know, I had this perceived lack of direction. And, and sometimes early on in my career, I didn't receive the direction that I probably needed um, because it se seemingly people didn't care enough to talk to some of the rookies sometimes. We were told to be seen and not heard, and we were supposed to just sort of figure it out on our own. Sometimes the rig would get parked out behind the station, and they would just say, knock yourself out, kid, go out there and train. They go, what? <laughs> so I was telling him these stories, and you know, I, was told, I told him you know, how there were a lot of times where I was told to be seen and not heard, shut up sometimes, and um, he just kind of looked at me, and he blinked his eyes, and he goes, wow, Cap, you know, I was never treated that way. And that's when the light bulb went on in my head. We've turned the corner. You know, all this talk of do your job, treat people right, give all that effort, have an all-in attitude, excellence is my responsibility, all that stuff had finally taken root. And it, you know, culture, the cultural change can reveal itself in very subtle and sometimes very innocent ways. And you have to be on the lookout for it. Because a lot of times we'll be looking to, you know, have that grand slam, you know, home run to, to change the culture overnight, but cultures are changed and wins are measured. You know, you can win a baseball game by a, a steady string of base hits. It's not, as, it's not as spectacular as this big, you know, reveal. But, you know, cultural change doesn't reveal itself like opening a, you know, a package on Christmas Day. It's something that, again, reveals itself in subtle and very innocent ways sometimes. And when he blinked and shrugged his shoulders and shrugged off that, that profundity that he uttered, wow, I was never treated badly on probation. That's when I realized that, that we, as an organization, had turned that corner at the station level. Anyone? I don't know how much they missed, but uh, I'll just start over. Tra transitioning from, uh, from being really fired up and boisterous to trying to ration my passion, one of the things I'm concerned about is when I interact with people younger than me, newer to our organization than I am, and they don't have the historical perspective that I've been through, to try and share that with them. I worry that, I, uh, that I'm one of those old guys telling them to shut up rather than encourage them. Do you have any, uh, any ideas? Should I follow that up with a, with a word of encouragement days later? What, uh, I guess I don't know what I'm asking. No, I, I, I totally hear you because I, mean, I think that we all, some of us in the room, we all go through that, that sort of, we, we reach a certain age and, and a time in service where things aren't new and exciting to us anymore. And that's, that's okay, that's the natural progression of things. Um, so long as you're not using the word shut up, you're, you're, the words shut up, you're probably doing okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've talked about this before. There was a, there was a when we did the PDX talk um, in Boring, 
uh, with Michael. There was a, a, a brother in the room who asked the question. He goes, he goes, he goes, you know, I got these. What do I do? Because I've got, you know, on alternating days, I've got a five-year plan or I've got a 10-year plan. And, you know, on the, on the five-year plan days, I just, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to do anything. I just, I'm, I'm pissed. I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm this. But on the 10-year day plans, I'm, I'm into it. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. You know, and I'm excited about the job. And, and I think that we all, if we're honest, we all have those ebbs and flows. You can't be 100% on 100% of your career. There's no way. But you can be an active participant in the way that things turn out. And you can, you can positively encourage people to, to go in the right directions. If you're not that person that's super excited about doing the things that, that you used to be excited about doing, point those, those rookies in the right direction, those people who are excited about it. And then be that person that facilitates training on those five-year days when you're like, oh, I got five years left and I can't do it anymore. But when, you're, when you are into it and you f you're feeling it and you've got, you're, you're in that 10-year mode or I could do this forever mode, be that person that shares something that you're passionate about, something that you love, and they can see that fire inside you. you know? But as, as long as you're that person that isn't you know, actively shutting them down and telling them absolutely not, you know, I, I think that there's ways around it. But, you know, we do all slow down as we get older, and there's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But, I mean, just the fact that you're here from, from Salem, right? You drove an hour to be here, right? Or more, right? It shows that you're still passionate about it. You still care. So, yeah. Should I take the mic and give it to people, kind of like Phil Donahue style? Would that be cool? <laughs> Run around in the, in the thing? So, Yeah. Hold on, wait for the mic. Here he comes. So uh, I'm a line guy. Just started, 35 years old. Um, and I've been told to lead from behind by a gentleman who does not want to follow, uh, an officer who doesn't want to change. Um, and I'm struggling with, with giving that passion. You know, when you get told, hey, you got to lead from behind, which is a phrase that I don't quite understand. Um, and the question I have is, how do you keep that passion uh, alive with an officer who's just wants to sit on the couch and watch TV? And you know, I'm three years out from retirement. The day I, you know, I'm eligible, I'm out. So I don't. I'm, I guess I'm asking, how do you, how do you lead from behind on that in that situation? Well, all of your motivation has to be internal. You can't rely on other people to motivate you. And that's one of the things that I've had to come to realize too. Is you know, my job is. You know, it kind of gets to, speaks to your question, you know. My job as a company officer, I don't feel is to motivate people anymore. It's to make sure they don't become unmotivated. That motivation and that fight and that desire has to come from you, right? I mean, and, and that's something that you'll see it in people. You'll see that fire and you'll say, all right, cool, that's great. Chill out a little bit. Let's, let's, let's bring that in a little bit because you're starting to rub people the wrong way. But, you know, you have to have some fight and some, some orneriness about yourself in order to keep that thing going. And, and for me, what, what helped me was to take that passion and that energy. And when I'm at work, I kind of tone it down a little bit. But when I'm out or I come to something like this and I network with people that are like-minded or I go to firemanship or I go to whatever conferences are, are nearby, that's where you sort of find your people. Does that make sense? Where, you know, it's, it's like this collective group hug where we all feel the same pain. It's like, you know, what they do to you, man? Oh, they did that to me too. But it is difficult to have that, that person that's a company officer that's a slug. But you have to be the one, you know, leading from the back seat doesn't necessarily mean, you know, saying, hey, we're going to go out and do these things. But you ask the captain questions. Hey, can, I, can we go out and train on this? I need to work on this. I'm new. Um, setting the example, being that person that when you go on an automatic fire alarm, the third time you've gone on the same building in the same day, you're that person that every time you go on that call, you're fully bunked out, you're doing a tool drop, you're, you're bringing the, the irons, you're bringing, you know, all that stuff, you're bringing the thermal imager, and if the, and, and that's happened to me where, you know, I was trying to lead from the back seat, and, you know, my, my captain, who wasn't super motivated, jumps off the rig in his bunker pants and his t-shirt and goes into the, the smoke investigation dressed like that, armed to fight the fire, if we found one, with the keys and the radio. And I'm pulling the irons off, I'm pulling the can off, I'm, I'm all dressed out and I'm throwing my air pack on and he says to me, Mr. Von Oppen, what is taking you so long? And I'm like, hey Cap, you know, last time I worked with you we had a three alarmer that we thought was nothing and we had to scramble and get dressed, remember that one? 
You know, and it, it wasn't me, I, more than being a smart ass, I was trying to lead from the back seat. And it's something that's, that's difficult to do, and it's something you gotta motivate yourself to do every single day. But, you know, you're the ones that are gonna change the cultures within your organizations, because when you get there, you're not gonna be that person that's sitting on the couch waiting to retire. Yes. There we go. Uh, you talked earlier about going to the department that had uh, mandated their officers to be at the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about if you've had experience with more of a um, bottom-up change occurring in departments, if you've seen that as much? Because I think in our department over the last four to five years, that's what we've started to see. You started to see junior guys you know, drilling on their own and bringing in other guys, and it's going up from the bottom as much as from the top. Yeah, I think that I think that bottom-up change is is the the most effective type of change because you've got those people that are in there for the long term, looking to you know create that long-term buy-in. And when, when we have peer-driven accountability, that's when accountability becomes something that's that's much more real than when it's coming down from on high. You know, when we say you know sometimes cultural change, we talk about creating accountability within our organization, and it's accountability is synonymous with disciplinary action. We're going to start, we're going to correct things by creating a sense of fear within our organization. And that's the wrong way of going about it. You know, what, what's going on in the fire service right now where the subcultures become the culture, if you look at, you know, what Aaron Fields is doing or what Gary Lane's doing or Brian Brush or a lot of the people that are out there doing great things, they're starting at the firefighter level. And as, as those firefighters work their way through the organization, that just becomes the cultural norm. Hard work, right? Um, accountability, dependability, right? What's the, what's the answer that Aaron always says? I mean, do work, right? Do good work, and things take care of themselves. So, you know, I encourage you to stick with it. You know, it, top, when, when you get the total organizational buy-in and everybody's in lockstep with, with doing the right thing, it's great. But a lot of times, the organizational values are gonna be different than what we're trying to push at the suppression level. We still need to do the right things. We still need to uphold the organizational values but we're gonna have to push and kick and scream and just stick with it at the firefighter level. And we as people who have you know, 20 years on the fire service or longer, we have to look at the fact that we've got these young, enthusiastic people out there going out there, seeking training, seeing what the industry standard is, what best practices are, and trying to bring those back to the organization, and we have to be open-minded. You know, our door has to be open and our minds have to be open to these new things. Even if we were those people, and I've run into this in my organization where, you know, 10 years ago or something like that, I, I'm probably adding some time to it, but, you know, I went and took Dave Dodson's high rise class, and I was super pumped on high rise and smooth bores, and, you know, fog nozzles are only for this, and, you know, and we were just, you know, two and a half, and we were losing our minds, and I, I, got, I came back to my organization, and I said, I'd like to do this. I was on the ladder company, and I was in training, and that was when I was told, you can't make that change, you're a firefighter. You have to wait till you're a, a deputy chief to make that change. Well, fast forward 10 years later, you know, the nozzle forward culture has kind of, you know, has taken over the fire service, you know, for the good of everybody. And some of our guys went and took that class, and there were guys that had less than four years on the job. And because some of us that are now in positions of influence as company officers had been stifled and been told to shut up, and told that we couldn't do these things, these guys come back and they're like, hey, we'd like to do this, okay, let's help you do it. Rather than being that impediment to them, you know, we stand back and we say, okay, I'm gonna help you move this forward. Here are, the, here are the things that I experienced in my career where I made mistakes, you know, I'm gonna help, let's help you get this thing, because it doesn't really matter who gets the credit. I mean, it'd be very easy for some of us to fold our arms and, and pout and say, I tried to do that 10 years ago, good luck, right? But that doesn't help move the ball forward. And the goal is to make us all better. But you know, water boiling from the bottom up, like they say, or creating grassroots movements, if we stick with those things, that's how true cultural change happens. And it takes a long time. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, Mark, we got one. Anyway, uh, so if you, don't, if you guys don't have any more questions, you know, I'll just kind of leave you. Oh, there is a question, sorry. Hi, Mark. Uh, Hi. 
So I stay away from blogs in general a little bit because I felt like they have been becoming more of a decisive rather than um, a uniting tool. When I read a lot of the blogs, not necessarily the bloggers themselves, but the people that are responding to them, I know we're trying to push a culture forward, but a lot of the rhetoric is very us versus them, which I don't think, you know, we're essentially an army to support our nation. When you try to divide the army, you're not gonna be very, um, you know, you're basically destroying it. What can we do to bring the conversation back to, we're bringing everybody forward and we're capturing the ones that are not following us right now, rather than um, trying to, lead, you know, creating this rhetoric where we leave people behind and we're just going, we are forward and we, you know, if you're not with us, you're against us. I think our, our conversation has to be, how do we bring everybody up to this new culture? Right. Um, what do you think we can do? I mean, obviously not post hateful things as an individual, but what can we do to make this an inclusive culture that brings everybody? Well, I think that we have to be, you know, the, the question was, if, if I'm paraphrasing, you know, a lot of what we see on social media in these, in these blogs and in the comments, it turns into um, an argument, right? And if you're not for us, you're against us, that kind of thing. And, and there is a lot of that out there. And I think that, you know, the, the sad thing that you see going on in the country, and it's a much bigger problem than it is in the fire service, it's, it's nationwide. We've, we've lost the ability to have polite, discussions about you know things in which we disagree we've lost the ability largely to just you know um, you know have those conversations that, that are tough to have because we may not see eye to eye but it doesn't make us bad people you know it doesn't we don't have to hate each other just because we don't see each other, see eye to eye on things I mean if 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 your department can't perform interior attack because you've only got you, know, you don't have enough people that are interior certified and you have to transitional attack, it doesn't make you a shitty fire department. You just do you know, what you gotta do with the tools that you're given, right? Uh, you know, transitional attack isn't the answer every time and aggressive interior attack isn't the answer every time, but you know, we, gotta, we gotta figure out you know, how we can talk about these things politely. But you know, we just have to understand and be open-minded. I think that that's, that's the main thing, is just, you know, I, Stop arguing about it. And, and on our page, on Fully Involved, if, if you start calling names and you start, um, you know, being abusive to other people, you're banned from the page. That's how I do it. That's my answer. If, you know what I mean? It's like you don't have a voice if you're not going to be, if you're not going to be cool about it and have, if you're going to start name calling or, or, or bashing any particular group, that's not what it's about. It's about community and it's about us trying to work together to get somewhere. And, and the only way that we grow is through you know, we grow through disagreement, through dissenting opinions, through, through you know, hearing different ideas. And we have to be open to those things. And, and I, I hope that somehow, some way, we can get back to that, you know, as a culture, especially, you know, here in America. I mean, it's, it's crazy how much we're so polarized. And it's sad to see. But, you know, for me, it's just about being able to see different points of view. And, and just because you have a different idea about something, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person or that you're, you're wrong, it's just different, it's a different perspective. And that's what this whole country is built upon, is different ideas, freedom of speech, that type of stuff. So, yes, in the front. You're gonna work out. So, um, for the firefighter that's making their way up through the ranks and becoming a leader and they're trying to create that culture and they're being somewhat uh, successful and let's say they become a leader, what advice or um, skills or abilities would you say that that person should practice or use to um, slowly and progressively keep moving their thoughts towards their goal? Um, not being too aggressive, or um, you know, what characteristics do you think they should practice so that they're not upsetting? The well, I, I think it's. We finished with your question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I interrupted you. you um, I think it's interesting that you you know you said you become a leader. You know, I I think that I think that if we teach people the right way we're telling them that they should be leading by example 
from the beginning. So you're always a leader. You're always leading. You're always, you're always that person that does the right thing, that leaves it better than you found it. You know, um, I, don't, I never believe that you promote into a position of leadership. I think you promote into a position of authority. But I think if you're always leading and you're always doing the right thing, when you get promoted, people will say, that makes sense. And so you have to be that person that, that has that motor that no matter what's going on around them, they're trying to do the right thing. They're that person that can be dependable. Um, but as far as when you, when you do arrive in that position, you know, when you finally you know, get into that position that, that the organization recognizes as a leadership spot, you have to be that person that's open-minded and, and be very humble. Because, and you have to activate those people around you because you know, your crew makes or breaks you. And you're only as good as the people that you surround yourself with. And if you're that person that has a big ego and, and comes in and tries to rule with an iron fist, it just doesn't work. Okay. Um, and let me um, see if I can find, right along those lines, um, there's a blog that I wrote about that, and I'll read it to you. It was for a promotional ceremony. It's short, um, but it, it talks about that. Okay, um, this goes right along with your question. So, if I could sit down with myself as a new officer and talk about what it's important to remember, here's what I would say. This is an excerpt from a speech that I wrote for a recent promotional ceremony. As you prepare to move into a writing position that the organization recognizes as a leadership spot, try to keep a few things in mind. There are shiny things that accompany this new writing position, namely a badge, a bugle or two, and possibly a glimmer of respect. Remember that you got to where you are in life because of who you are. If you've been leading, they'll follow. If you haven't, you've got a lot of work to do. If you've been leading, don't change who you are because you changed writing positions on the rig. Respect is found in who you've always been. You earn it with your every interaction. If you've given due respect to every position you've held, that glimmer of respect will shine a little bit brighter. You are and must remain a functional member of the team. Remember that you are always a writer. The team is more important than any individual. Don't get distracted by those shiny objects that festoon your collar and your, and your chest. They're worthless if you try to be something that you're not. If you're not you, those shiny things will be just decoration and they won't mean very much. Be concerned with who you are and not who people think you should be. Be yourself and if you do, you never have to remember to be somebody else. When things get tough, your character is what needs to shine through more than your beagles and your badge. The craft is about people. Retain a sense of humility. Take the craft more seriously than you take yourself. This job is more real than any book you'll ever read. If you're honest, you'll be humbled every day by the greatness of your peers, by how much there is yet to learn, and by how much responsibility you own. Hubris is one of life's poisons. Don't drink from that cup. Remember to maintain the beginner's mind and never lose the sense of wonder. Listen more than you talk. There's a big difference between time served and time in the service of others. This is but another step in a lifelong journey to mastery. It's not about your time in your writing position, it's about what you do with your time in that position. Say to yourself, may I, ever, may I ever strive to master the craft? Do your job, treat people right, give a lot of effort, and have an all-in attitude. So, yeah, so just thanks. It just, uh, you know, you asked that question that kind of made me noodle down that path. Yes? Good morning. Good morning. How do you deal when, as a firefighter or even as a new officer, deal with leadership from above that's old school, been promoted into it, hasn't really been trained at leadership or management skills, and they have that old school mentality and just stifle you when you have this passion that we all have in this room? Well, so sort of define the old school mentality. What, what do you mean? Like you. I've experienced the same things you're talking about. The, you know, keep quiet, don't question, do what you're told, this is the way we do it. And when you come in with these new ideas, or they just don't want to listen to it. And a lot of it, I feel, is their insecurity, their inability to lead and manage because they've never been taught. And they're doing the best they can, but they don't have the skill set. Right, so when I, 
was imagining or, or complaining. My first thought a lot of times when I don't like something that's going on is to complain about it. That's what I do. <laughs> I just complain, right? And I, you know, some other people that I work with are good, good, you know, they mellow me out and I go, hey man, you know, because we have to work together, right? Um, but do you have, in your agency, do you have those imaginary they and them that are holding you back? Yeah, right? Um, we do too. And I think that sometimes those people that are in upper level positions don't have quite as much influence on what goes on in the firehouse as we think that they do. And I was sitting, when I was a firefighter and I was taking the, the company officer series in California, I, I was sitting in a, in, a, in a command class and there was a BC leading the discussion and he said, what's the most important position in the fire service? And they're going around the room, BC, 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 BC. And what comes to me, I go, company officer. Wrong. And they went to the next person, battalion, two battalion. Okay, because, <laughs> and I was a firefighter at the time, and I really do believe that, you know, at the company level, or at, you know, at the, at the suppression level, the, the company officers are the most important position in the fire service. And I think that it, when you're in the firehouses, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do to keep that passion alive, even if, you know, we're not getting the support that we have, that we feel that we need from the people from above. Because who needs to give you permission to come in to work out early with your crew before shift to do PT. Nobody, you do that. Who needs to go out and give you permission to, you know, give you permission to go out and do coffee drills, estimate stretches, look at buildings, walk buildings. Nobody, we do that. Eat meals together, all those things, you know, sit around the coffee, or sit around the table and talk about, you know, events that are relevant in the fire service. We control that and it's all within the mission, right? So. I would encourage you to just to do those things and, and work on the things that you're excited about because all of those things that we're talking about support the mission of the fire service. They're not, they're not contradictory. And, and anybody that comes up to you and says, hey, you train too much or you're working too hard, what's that? Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. I know, I see you. Here comes the mic. Any advice in that same vein? Because we've talked about leadership, but at your line level, people that resist the training, the discussion, because they are that empty uniform, going back to your, your measure blog, right. where pulling hose is a arduous thing, not fun anymore but you've got four guys that want to do it. What self-talk have you given yourself to stay motivated or what have you said to your peer of, hey, you know, grab a gear, we gotta find that fire again? Yeah, I, I think that what you have to do is you have to appeal to, you know, if, if it's a veteran that is, you know, in the firefighter spot that isn't excited about the job anymore and they don't want to go out and train, it's like you have to appeal to the things that they used to love about the job. Yeah, that's why you have to have those discussions with people and find out what motivates them. You know, talk to them one on one and say, "Hey, you know, I know that I know where you are. I know where you are in life. I know what's going to." Because there's a lot of times there are things that are going on outside of the workplace that that affect you know their performance on the job. Find out what's going on with them, but you know, talk to them and say, "Hey, for these these moments of time where we're out there, I need you to be engaged, and I'm not gonna." I'm not going to force you to do this stuff 100% of the time. You're very confident in your job. Most, most of these people, you're surprised a lot of times. You think that they, they're not motivated and they don't want to do anything, and then they'll show up on a call and they'll be like, whoa, where'd that come from? Right? But appeal to them and appeal to them personally and say, hey, I'm going to rely on your expertise and your knowledge and your time in the job um, because I need you, and I need you to be a functional member of this team. I can't do my job unless you do yours, um, and we're looking out for each other in that way. Does that make sense? Um, but, you know, the last resort to me is, I mean, if, if someone's absolutely not motivated, I mean, yeah, we're just going to go out and do it, and you just order them to do it, and that's no fun either, you know, but we try to strike some sort of a chord, some sort of a, a discussion where we, we reach each other on, on a level where, you know, we're both invested in it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry to be quick. Um, how do you deal with charismatic complainers at all oh. levels, whether it's firefighters or officers? Charismatic complainers. Um, okay. So the like the unofficial, like the 
the unofficial leaders in the fire station. Absolutely. Right. Well, it kind of goes along the same lines that we just talked about. You know, you have to find, you know, those, those informal leaders are those ones that can be those, those rogue voices within your, your organization that can work against you. And sometimes you have to take those people and, and speak to them on a level, like I said, appeal to what their strengths are, talk to them. And, and if they're charismatic about something, they're, they, they have passion and, and they got, all of us got into the fire service because we're excited about something, right? Some aspect of the job and appeal to that. Um, and that's where that whole rogue idea came from, was, you know, you, you talk about these, I was talking to Jerry Smith, who's the, the head soccer coach on the women's side at Santa Clara University, and they live, they live in our neighborhood, and he's, he's been pretty successful, and, and we were talking leadership and, and that sort of thing, and, and I, I was talking about the people that are on board with a message, and blah, 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 and he goes, I'm not worried about the people that are on board with the message. I'm worried about those people that work actively against me, that, that act, you know, actually hate me as a soccer coach. But they're very influential. They're strong players or this or that. And you can translate that straight to the fire service. You have to find a way to employ those people and give them a platform occasionally to, so that they can satisfy that need for attention or whatever it is. Right? There, there's something that's causing them to act out. So find out what they're good at and say, hey, you're good at this. You know, we don't see eye to eye. You know, I don't, I don't like, you know, you don't like me and I'd be really disappointed in myself if I liked you, but let's figure out a, let's figure out a way to, to make this work, right? Because we have to, it's, it's, we gotta make this thing go. And these are the things that I see you being really talented with and I would like to give you the opportunity to step forward and teach the group and get some of this energy out. I think that that's a way of doing it. But that, that whole conversation about rogues and everything, and that's where that name came from, where we you know, go rogue, right? Because in the room here, if we're excited and we're those people that are stoked on the job and we don't, we don't have that creative outlet to have our voices heard, we can do some pretty terrible things sometimes. And, or we can just be that, those people that are doing things in the right direction and, and working and working and working and try to make things better and it pisses the people off that sit in the recliners all day and they say, oh, those guys are rogues. Well, no, we're not. You know, if, if, if being 10 toes up in the recliner and sucking at your job is, is the status quo and that's what's accepted here, yeah, we're going to be rogue firefighters. We're going to be those guys who are going to be out there training, pulling hose, forcing doors, doing searches, being good at our jobs. We're going to be those first ones, first, you know, the first ones up for assignment because people know who the players are. You know, people know who's pretending and they know who's contending, right? Okay, I would just encourage you guys, thank you very much for, for giving me this time today, and I would encourage you guys to listen to the voices that, that you know, are here today, take it all in, and a lot of what I hear sometimes is that the people that need to hear the messages that are coming out aren't here today. Well, you're here today, take those messages back to your organization, and, and, and be those people that continue to push, right? Don't give up, because okay, the people that make the changes are the ones that say what they're gonna do, and then they actually do it. Okay. Before you get off stage, I know you have a sports spot. I really want it, right? Why are you doing that to me? I was done. I was done. You're killing me. Okay. It's the big four and the four Ps. Yeah, the four Ps was actually kind of, as I was trying to formulate what this talk was going to be today, I came up with this. You know, passion is, is something that's very important, but what are you going to do with it, right? How do you take that undisciplined, sometimes aimless, angry passion and turn it into purpose, right? Um, and it takes, it takes patience in order to do that, okay? Um, it, change takes a really long time. When you're looking at an organization from the outside that's doing things the right way, you think that that change occurred overnight. No, quick change happens slowly. And like I said earlier, it's something that reveals itself innocently. Something that, you know, you, you'll have to look for it subtly and innocently. Um, and you have to give yourself credit for the wins that you do get, because if you don't, 
If you're that person that is never satisfied and you don't take pause every once in a while and give yourself credit for the wins that you do get, you're always losing. And you're always gonna have that sense of defeat and you're never gonna feel like you're, you're ever accomplishing anything. So um, we have to take those things and turn it all into purpose, right? Take that, take that energy, take that, that love for the job, the love of the game, the love for preparation and turn it into purpose. What's your why? What are you trying to accomplish? Because it's great that you're passionate, awesome. I love the fact, I love your enthusiasm. What the hell are you gonna do with it? And so much of what we do is we spin our wheels and we're, we're passionate and we're not patient and we just want change right now and we don't have our purpose. And there's a saying out there that says, he who knows his why can endure any how, right? And it kind of goes along the lines with what Simon Sinek has to say, if you've listened to any of his amazing TED Talks. You know, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. What's your why? What are you trying to accomplish? And when we put all of these things together, when we take um, passion, patience, and purpose, that's when we get progress, okay? And again, you have to look for it because it reveals itself in subtle ways. And I know in my organization, you know, we, we see it where, you know, I talked about the rookie who just said, gosh, I was never treated badly on probation. Or when you have an engine company that shows up when you've been doing all kinds of training, you know, hose, search, forcible entry, all of these different disciplines over the course of 10 years and you think nobody's listening and they show up, your average engine company that nobody really has a whole lot of expectations of, which is an arrogant stance to take, but when they show up and they crush it and they do everything right and they shrug their shoulders and they go, what's the big deal? I was just doing my job. That's when you know you've reached you know, a place that's a good place. Okay. Thank you.